Have you ever looked at something and thought, now that just can't be right? I'm a chemist. To be specific, I study how two or more chemical compounds, say a biological target and a binder, come into contact with each other through weak, reversible interactions. Simply put, it's like when you hug someone, you become an aggregate of two people, but you don't find yourself glued together forever. It's temporary. You can let go. In our bodies, this kind of interaction between chemical compounds happens all the time. Every time we inhale, a very large molecule picks up the oxygen in our lungs, carries it through our bloodstream, and drops it off where our bodies need it most. Another example is DNA, most commonly found in the form of a double helix, two strands recognizing each other, coming together like a zipper. All of this happening through reversible interactions, and these interactions can lead to some pretty important outcomes. Three years ago, I found myself in France, working in the Marnie lab, searching for new chemical binders for an unusual form of DNA implicated in the development of human diseases. Trying to find a binder of this kind is a lot like having to sort through 200 different keys to find one that might open a locked door. Some keys won't fit in the lock at all. Some might only fit part way. Others might fit, but fail to turn. Very few of those keys are going to be able to unlock that door. In theory, we could examine the features of the lock in great detail and design the key to fit it. But in practice, different story. Imagine you've gone to all that trouble designing the perfect key, and now the moment you introduce it into the lock, the presence of the key actually makes the lock change shape. Add to this the fact that we're working on a molecular level. We can't see these interactions with the naked eye. So rather than design a key, I was trying to see whether any of the chemical compounds previously made in the Petit Jean lab here would fit our DNA target. To speed up this process, the Marini lab had developed a screening method that would eventually allow me to test up to 48 keys at the same time. The data from these tests could be converted into numbers that look something like this. So the higher the number, the better the key fits the lock. So I was initially looking at a number of relatively weak binders compared to a known gold standard in the field. But then I got this result. Scientists are trained to think critically and objectively about their work. So I took a look at this amazing result and was fairly sure I'd made a mistake somewhere. When your car fails to start, you don't call a tow truck immediately, right? You try to start it again and again before you come to a con conclusion. The same holds true for scientific research. So I reran that experiment three times, but the results checked out. I was looking at a hit a chemical compound that was right up there with some of the best binders previously developed in the field, something that could strongly and selectively bind to an unusual fold of DNA that we call a guanine quadruplex. Now I could take that hit back to the drawing board and modif modify its chemical structure in order to fine tune its properties. And all of, these, all of these exciting possibilities were opening up because we've just barely scratched the surface of the roles that these quadruplexes, these biological targets, play in the development of diseases like cancer. Let's talk about DNA for a minute. Most of your cells have a complete and identical library, and that's DNA, the building blocks of life. Information is stored in book-like units called genes and each gene is made up of words spelled from the same four letters. One book may dictate the color of your eyes. Another may define your risk of developing breast cancer. Different books are opened and read to drive specific cellular events, controlling everything from your hormone levels to your immune response. Cancer happens when some of those books are not copied properly. You start to see typos appear in the text. The books that promote cellular events leading to the development of cancer, what we would call oncogenes, are left open to be read and processed continuously. 
All of this ultimately leads to the uncontrolled growth and division of abnormal cells. Now, in order for any of these books to be read, the normal double helix of DNA has to unzip, becoming temporarily single-stranded. For the purposes of this talk, let's think about it like this. The single strand of DNA is the chain of a necklace, and the cell machinery that reads and processes that DNA moves down the chain like beads. If they happen to come across a region in the chain that's formed a knot, those beads can't go any further. The knot is a guanine quadruplex, and we've known about their formation for a long time now. We also know that our cells have ways to unravel these knots, but there's a reason why we might not want this to happen. Bioinformatics has recently highlighted the tendency of these knots to form in the DNA chain right before oncogenes. So if there was a way to make these knots into more permanent barriers to the beads on the chain, then we could potentially prevent the processing of these oncogenes. And these are genes involved in all aspects of cancer development, from the formation of new blood vessels to the spreading of cancer cells through the body. The implications are clear. We're developing chemical binders that can stabilize guanine quadruplexes, that can tighten the knot to the point where it forms a physical barrier between the cell machinery and the oncogene. Ongoing research in the field has shown us that by forming this knot, we can, in fact, block the reader from opening that book. In other words, we can potentially prevent the cellular processes that lead to cancer from occurring. Do our binders work like this? Our studies have shown that our binders do interact strongly with our desired DNA target, but they don't interact much with the more common double helix of DNA, which is an advantage if we're thinking about side effects down the line. We also have some fairly promising preliminary results from an anti-cancer screening program. In the presence of our binders, five out of 60 human cancer cell lines tested do show a decrease in cell growth and division. All of that being said, most of what I do in the lab still involves the study of two molecules, one quadruplex, one binder, on their own. These studies are critical. We need to know how these molecules interact before we move them into more complex environments. Even a transition to studying these binders in human cells in the lab raises questions. A human cell contains hundreds of different molecules. Is the effect we're seeing actually due to the interaction between the targeted quadruplex and our binder? And if it is, then will it work the same way in a mouse? Remember, living organisms are made up of millions of cells, a whole other level of complexity. At this stage, there are also other considerations. Can the binder exit the bloodstream and enter the cell? Will it target cancer cells specifically? How is it going to get out of the body? If everything is going well, then how do we formulate this binder for human consumption? How do we administer it? All questions that must be answered before we move to clinical trials. The media attention this research has recently received and the public response has been both humbling and overwhelming. My supervisors and I have been swamped with questions about clinical trials from cancer patients and their friends and families. To be honest, though, we're still in the early stages of research, and there's still a lot of questions that we need to answer. If nothing else, I hope I leave you today with a better appreciation of the scientific process involved in this kind of research the checkpoints that must be passed so that we can be absolutely certain that the chemical binder we want to put into a human body is safe, or at least that we're fully aware of the risks. It's a process that often starts with a somewhat serendipitous discovery, does not always go in a straightforward path, and builds on the past research of the scientific community. It's made me realize how critical curiosity-driven research can be. If scientists had never thought, hey, I wonder why these knots are forming, and where, and how all of this works, then we as a field would never have reached the stage where we can ask the question, 
how can we use this? And I wouldn't be here today giving you a snapshot into how the stabilization of guanine quadruplexes is now emerging as one of the many exciting new strategies in anti-cancer therapeutics. I can't tell you where our research and the field as a whole will be 10 years from now, because we're still learning new things about these quadruplex targets every day. We know so much more about cancer today than we did 10 years ago. Translating the fundamental research we're doing in the lab now into a clinical setting is a long road, and it's going to take a whole community of experts, not just chemists like me, but biochemists, biologists, cancer specialists and clinicians to get there. I'm hopeful, though, that this work represents a step forward along that path. Thank you.